Me in your Bibles then to 1 Peter chapter 3 as we continue our verse by verse study through Peter's first epistle, chapter 3, verse 15 through 17, reading from the New Authorized Version. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, truth divine, dawn upon this will of mine. Dear Spirit of God, wake my spirit, clear my sight. This is your holy word, dear Heavenly Father. It is to be our rule and practice for life. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that the spirit of truth, your Holy Spirit, then would guide us into your truth, convict us of it. May we repent of it where we violate it. May we walk in its light, dear Heavenly Father, as true children of yours desire to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been going through 1 Peter, and we know we've been dealing with Peter's writing to suffering saints in modern-day Turkey, in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which is modern-day Turkey, approximately 300 square, thousand square miles. And we've stated that the persecution of the saints there is not systematic, it is not perpetual, it is not provincial-wide, rather it was sporadic, it was intermittent, and because of that, it left an anxiety that was there in the saint's mind. You never know when it might crop up and the degree of it. Sometimes it was just verbal abuse. Sometimes it was physical abuse, even to the point of death. They were losing their jobs. They were losing limbs. They were losing life. Sometimes they were separated from families. Sometimes they were imprisoned. All sorts of suffering that was going on. And the question that keeps nagging me as we go through this, and you've heard me repeat this many times, but can we relate? Can we really relate to those saints that Peter was writing to? I look at 2 Peter 3, or Timothy 3.12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Does that include me? Does that include you? And that suffering then, what form does it take and what form will it take if I then am truly a child of God and I'm on the, the firing line, the front line, as it were? You and I ask ourselves, do we have skin in the game? This last week, I listened to a sermon that was sent me by my grandson from Lou Giglio. He's a pastor down in Atlanta, Atlanta. And he was speaking at Piper's National Conference. And Lou had just gotten back from Rwanda. And we all know the hundreds of thousands of deaths that occurred in Rwanda. And he was taken to a church. And we know the concrete block churches. We've all seen them. And he went inside. And he stopped. He was aghast. There along the walls were piled up the clothes of the saints. And there amongst the chairs were the bones of the saints. What had happened was the doors had been locked while the saints were meeting inside. They were systematically hacked to pieces and killed one by one. He said he got back from that. It had been several months. And he was still trying to process it and get over it. If we have that image in our heads, now can we relate to Peter? 
when he comes to these same kind of suffering saints, and he says in God's revelation, I have a word of encouragement for you. I have a word of exhortation to you. Jesus said, the servant is like his master and the disciple like his teacher. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. We glibly sing, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, my desire to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, my desire to be like him. Does that include suffering? Are we willing to admit that also? Chapter 2, 13 to 3, 12, remember Peter addressed these different groups in society. Now we're in a different section here in 3, 13 to 4, 11, where he's addressing here now is he says, Christians, you're called to suffer. You're called to suffer. And yet God's blessings come to those who suffer. In 3, 13 to 17, he says there's no need to fear suffering because suffering is actually God's pathway to blessings. And when we get to chapter 3, 18 to 22, we'll see that Christ suffered and he triumphed through suffering. And you know, it's a, a repeated theme in 1 Peter. <laughs> chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of, of, of spirit that was in them was testifying. The spirit of Christ was testifying and indicating then beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. As it was for Christ, so it should be for us. Suffering is the pathway to glory. And we can add to that, it's also the pathway to God's blessings. Chapter 4, 12 through 19, we'll get into it again. But let those who suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. To ensure their being secure against the hostility, Peter listed here certain things that were incumbent upon these saints then. As they progressed in their holiness, it wasn't just to have them sit in a closet and pray and to do nothing, to let go and to let God, remember that is passive sanctification, which is anti-biblical. That is not what the Bible teaches when it comes to sanctification. Rather, as we've already shared in our catechism this morning in our soldier sword, that the sanctification is when it's progressive, begins, it's passive, it's all of God, Positional sanctification, God looks at us in our rebirth and our justification, we're just like Christ, but then it's progressive after that. It's divine sovereignty and it's us working. We have responsibilities. So Peter exhorts the believers to their responsibilities in their day-by-day -day, day -day sanctification. In verse 13 he says, maintain a zeal for goodness. Maintain a zeal for goodness in verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? Zeal, a burning desire to please God, to do his will and to advance his glory in the world. That's J.C. Ryle's definition of zeal. Verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. Verse 14 and verse 17 of our text today. Be willing to suffer no matter what the perceptions are of your actions. And then verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You're, we're to exalt Christ at all times. And then the latter part of verse 15. To be knowledgeable enough to defend the faith. Whenever, wherever. And then verse 16. He says, maintain a good conscience. I've entitled the sermon today, Do We Have a Good Conscience? We could also entitle it, How to Maintain a Good Conscience. What is a conscience? And what's a good conscience? Do we have a good conscience? 
how the Word of God and the Holy Spirit function and, related, and, related, and relate to conscience. Do we know that? Should we always let the conscience be our guide? Is the conscience infallible or not? How does the conscience function in believers versus unbelievers? Is the keeping of a good conscience an obligation for us? Is it easy to do or isn't it? What is conscience? Did you know that ignorance is not innocence? That God reveals His righteousness both to unbelievers and believers in creation and in conscience. Romans 1.20, the invisible things of Him are clearly seen by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In Romans 2.14.15, the Gentiles which do not have the law, they do the things in the law. And then their conscience bears witness in them. And their thoughts then express either accusing or excusing them. Ignorance is not innocence. God reveals His righteousness to everyone in creation and conscience. Now, there's not saving faith in that, but they're accountable for it. What is conscience? Conscience, as John MacArthur defined it, is that God created self-judging faculty in man that either accuses us or excuses us. Conscience. Martin Luther says our conscience condemns us. You remember when he was at the Diet of Worms? April 1521? He was told to recant all of his teachings and his writings. He said, unless I am convinced by conscience and plain reason, I will not recant. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. Unless I'm convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I cannot recant. I cannot, will not recant. God help me, here I stand. I can do no other. But you know, Luther was not right on that to say that conscience condemns us. That's only part of the picture. Conscience can condemn us, but it also can excuse us. You see, the conscience can limit evil. It can retard evil in it. But how many of us know the truth of God's Word, and we know the truth in our conscience, and the Holy Spirit is working in our conscience and all that, and we have a law of conscience. We know what to do, and what do we do with it? We violate it anyway, don't we? We can violate it anyway. You see, it can excuse us. And what prevents that? Prevents that is the depths of our faith. What prevents that is the depth of our faith in the, in the scriptures. So it's not only cognitive, it's related to our will also at the same time. You see, the conscience is like a sundial. It's fairly accurate and valuable but only so when the sun is shining on it. Conscience, someone has said, is like a pencil. It works best when it's sharpened by the Word of God. So our conscience is that God-created, self-judging faculty in us that is to be informed by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Jiminy Cricket, you remember that? I grew up with that. Walt Disney's classic, Pinocchio. Jiminy Cricket would say, let your conscience be your guide. Sorry, Jiminy, that's wrong. Let your conscience be your guide. It's not always true. There again, because of Romans 2.15, the conscience can accuse us, the conscience can excuse us. See, how many people have you heard today out there in the secular world that says, you know, my conscience, I'm going to let that be my guide. That conscience is infallible. My conscience told me to do this. My conscience told me to do that. No, friends, the con conscience is not an infallible guide. 
And it's not the same as the voice of God. It's not the same as the law of God. And it, not, it should not always be obeyed as if it's the will of God. But yet, it can restrain evil. And when it's informed by the Spirit and the Word of God working concurrently together, working on our conscience, then you see, the conscience can restrain evil in us. Then it is right to say we have a conscience that's captive. If it's captive to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God. So my prayer is for spirit illumination into God's truths relating to a good conscience today. That we would agree with Aquinas that it's man's judgment of himself according to God's judgment of him. And that we would grasp these necessary truths to how to maintain a good conscience. That we'd grasp maintaining a good conscience can be ours if we're secure in our faith, in the Spirit's enabling, against the world, the flesh, the devil, the persecutors, and the oppressors. Do we have a good conscience? Or how do we maintain a good conscience? The first thing is to fear God. Fear God. Verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Fear God. You want to maintain a good conscience? Fear God. That's the theme, one of the main themes of this first epistle of Peter. Chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Live your lives in fear of God. The absence of that is Romans 3.18. There is no fear of God. Then you live a life of sin. That's a definition of sin. Chapter three, or 2, verse 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. You see, fearing God comes first before you honor any king. Before you honor any human government or any human beings or anybody else. Fear God first. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord will be safe. You fear God. Let the chips fall where they may. Chapter 3, verse 2, and when they observe your chaste conduct, accompanied by fear. Conduct accompanied by fear. John Murray says the fear of God is the sum of godliness. It's the soul of godliness. What's godliness? Thomas Watson says in the godly man's picture, godliness is that perfect harmony between God's precepts, his doctrines, and the practice. Perfect harmony between precepts and practice. That's godliness. Fear of God is the soul of godliness. The controlling sense of God's majesty and the profound reverence which such an apprehension elicits that the corollary of that is everything that you and I do. The first response in our mind should be, what is this circumstance in, and me? How does it relate to God? That we see God's presence in all things. God controlling all things. Working all things to good. Bringing things to His sovereign end and purposes. That we fear God. Then I think you and I could say one with God is a majority. If you fear God. Just think what God could do with people that truly fear Him. Look at the history, what God has done through individual men, whether it be Martin Luther, whether it be John Calvin, whether it be John Wesley, whether it be J.C. Ryle. We can go down and we can list any number of people that feared God. And now one man with God is a majority can make a real difference. How are these saints going to stand up against their persecutors? First of all, fear God. Maintain a good conscience. You see, a good conscience. It's a clear conscience. It's a blameless conscience. Remember, 
Paul in Acts 24, 16 said he had a blameless conscience before God and man, a conscience without offense before man and God. It all begins with fearing God. Do we have a good conscience? First point is fearing God. The second one is set your hope. Set your hope. How to maintain a good conscience is to set your hope. That's also in verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The hope. The hope. Hope is the daughter of faith. You can't have hope and faith separated. They are inseparable. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, the definition of faith. The evidence of things not seen is faith looking to the future is hope. The difference between faith and hope is hope is more comprehensive. Faith is more comprehensive, excuse me, than hope. Faith is past, present, and future. Faith believes in the God then who promises and does things. Whereas hope then focuses on the future, the fulfillment of those promises, the certainty, the surety of those. See, humans have hope and they have a wish, and in that wish is, there's fear connected with it. The possibility that it will not come to pass. Contrast that with Christian hope. Christian hope is a surety and a certainty that what God has said, it will come to pass. That's why you see in Hebrews 6, 19, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The emblem of hope is an anchor. And those Christians persecuted in the first four centuries, in the Roman catacombs and that, the emblem that they put, the symbol of hope on the catacombs and the walls was an anchor. An anchor. Also in Ephesians 6, 17, put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is hope. Hope, it secures the body, even though the body is being persecuted and all of that and is suffering, you see, the mind is protected in that. It is secure. What is it secure in? The hope that we have in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Christ our hope. Romans 15.13, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our hope. God is our hope. Psalm 78, 7 says, Set your hope on God. Set your hope in God and do not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. You see, those who fear God and set their hope on God, those are ones who it says in verse 15, they sanctify the Lord God in their hearts. The word is hagias there. It means to be separate, it also means to be not conformed. But the meaning of this is sanctify the Lord God in your hearts is to extol God, to magnify Him. Psalm 34, 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. You see, those saints who truly know who Christ is, who know the truths of God's Word, truly fear Him, and those are the ones who set their hope in Him. That no matter what comes their way, oppressors, suffering, whatever, they have a good conscience. They will not waver. They have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Where the presence has entered behind the veil, even Jesus has become a high priest forever. Hebrews 6, 18 through 20. Set your hope. You see, a lot of hope is looking for the future as you and I look at the blessings that we have in Christ in the future. Have you contemplated them? What do we have in Christ in the future? See, we know that what He's begun, He will complete. Philippians 1, 6. There's a coming a day in 1 John 3, 2 that we will see Him like He is and we'll be like Him. No more sin in us. We'll be glorified. We'll see Him face to face. We know in Matthew 8, 11 that we're going to go into glory to be with Him, but also to see our loved ones who have gone before with us. In John 14, He's preparing a mansion for us that we can dwell there with Him forever. 
that we will see him face to face. In Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At their right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you set your hope on the things that are sure and certain that are ours in the hereafter? And you see, when that happens, what happens? It raises our hopes. It raises our heart. It purifies our heart. We have a desire then to be like Christ. To be pure as He is pure. Hope. Hope. We set our hope. Do we have a good conscience? How do we maintain a good conscience? We fear God. We set our hope. And thirdly, we defend the faith. We defend the faith. That's also in verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who has a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You want to maintain a good conscience, you've got to know the scriptures. I'll never forget. We had to, I think I told you this when we had our garden business. We had two older ladies in the yard, and they were of a reformed denomination. And they'd been out west. It was Montana or Wyoming. And they couldn't find a reformed church close by, so they went to a Baptist church. Baptist church. And these two older ladies informed us in the yard, oh, those Baptists, they are people of the word. Oh, I said, that's interesting. They're people of the word. People of the word. Is that true of us? Isaiah 20, to the law and to the testimony. They speak not according to this word. There is no truth in them. Is that us? Can we defend the faith? Do we know the faith? John 17, 3, this is life eternal. They might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Do we truly know God? How do we know God? It's through his revelation. It's through his word. Do we spend time in his word every day? Every day. Remember Luther? When Luther was having a tough day in front of him, when he knew that he was going to have oppressors and persecutors come against him, he knew that the day was coming. There were a bunch of trials. What did he do? Instead of getting up at 4 a.m., he got up at 2 a.m. He'd spend an extra two hours in the Word and prayer, preparing for that day. He knew the Word. Psalm 119, 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart. What? That I might not sin against thee. Do you memorize the soldier's sword? Do you memorize it? Or did you just read it? Memorize God's Word. Memorize God's Word. We had an old saint of ours, a dear friend of ours. She was 100 years of age. She taught Sunday school for many, many years. And she said, Pastor Ron, I can't memorize like I used to. The mind just ain't what it used to be. Oh, I said, well, what do you do? Because she said she's still trying to memorize. Well, what I knew now is I take a psalm, for example, and what I do is I reread it, I reread it, I reread it, and I just keep rereading it. Finally, she says, I think what I'll do, I'll get it pounded in my head. It'll be just like memorization. Have you done that? You keep rereading God's word? Mining the truths that are there? Pray for the Holy Spirit to go before and to lead you into God's word? And then, once you know God's word, what do you do with it? Is it just an intellectualism that you put it in your head and you know the facts so that if we had a trivia game that you in trivial pursuit that you'd get top prize? What's the use of God's word in your head? It's to be there so that you and I have an apologia of the faith. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, you and I are ambassadors for Christ as if Christ, God, were proclaiming himself through us. So God's word should go through us then and out, an apologia, defense of the faith. Remember, it's both positive and negative. Philippians 1, 7 and 17. Positive is the gospel, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. You should be able to give all of the details then of the gospel, what it means to be saved in Christ, to put your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's the positive side of your message. Then the negative side of your message is that you have a defense of the faith. You should know there, as it says in Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as you have been taught that you may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to refute. Both to exhort, there's the positive, and refute the negative. 
So when air comes up, you'll be able to, Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love, but you address the truth, see? And you confront the air that is there because you know that air, when it enters the church body, is like leaven. Galatians 5.9, it can permeate the whole lump. So we need to excise it. Defend the faith. You want a good conscience? You want to maintain a good conscience? Be able then, have that assurance in yourself. The Holy Spirit, you know that you can defend the faith. Do we have a good conscience? How to maintain a good conscience? We fear God. We set our hope. We defend the faith. And fourthly, we submit to suffering. We submit to suffering. Verses 16 and 17. Having a good conscience. You see, if we can defend the faith, if we set our hope, if we fear God, then we have a good conscience. Having that good conscience, then when they defame you of evildoers. Notice, it says when. You might want to circle that in your Bible. It doesn't say if, does it? It says when. If you want to put a cross-reference right there in the margin, put 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Or you can put John 15.20, Jesus says the disciple is not above his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. That when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. We're going to have these evildoers that come against us, those who revile your good conduct in Christ. How do we respond? Look at chapter 2, verse 23. Who when is reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. So we follow Christ's example. We don't return insult for insult, reviling for reviling, retaliation for retaliation. We don't, you see. We commit ourselves to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, the taking down of strongholds. You see, God is the one who will take the vengeance. He'll do the retaliating. He'll make things right. You and I are to proclaim the truth and defend the faith, have the good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your conduct in Christ may be ashamed. And that is the symbol of all of those. Shame comes about, guilt from a violation of a standard. Those who violate God's word incur guilt and shame. Romans 6.21 is a definition of the ungodly. They live a life of shame, fruitlessness, and death. A life of shame, fruitlessness, and death. That they may be ashamed. Look back at chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. God has good purpose in this. Chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pil pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil against you as evildoers, notice the when there also, not if, but when they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Like we've said before, you see, God has good purpose in that, in that even in that, your oppressors, while they are oppressing you, they observe the good works which you do, and in observing their good works, some of them will come to saving faith in Christ. That God will use your faithful testimony in defense of the faith through it all, through your suffering, and your non-retaliation, non-reviling, not returning insults for insults, that God will use that to leave some of your persecutors or oppressors to saving faith in Christ. We need to know that when we suffer, that God has good purpose in it all. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. We, when we suffer the tribulation and troubles, why? That in our trouble, we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. How can we have true empathy for others if we don't suffer ourselves? So when we suffer and we go through it all, then we can truly relate to others. And you see, and then in relating to others in the suffering, then they will also give us an ear and hear what we have to say. Spurgeon says a man is never made thoroughly useful unless he's had suffering. 
Think of Jesus' suffering. Hebrews 5.8, he learned obedience. How? By the things which he suffered. By the things which he suffered. Submit to suffering. We'll get into this in, in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory may be revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory of God rests on you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But you notice he says there, he says in verse 15, he says, Let none of you suffer as a, meter, a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. Same as chapter 2, verse 20. For what credit is it? If when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And then he says, chapter 4, 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God Commit the keeping of their souls to him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Knowing that when we suffer, God works it for good. And that what he has begun, he will complete in us. Philippians 1.6 and Romans 8.28 Submit to suffering and do not fear man. Do not fear man. Those who revile your good conduct in Christ that may, may be a shame for it is better if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Do we have a good conscience? How do we maintain that good conscience? We fear God. We set our hope. We defend the faith. We submit to suffering. And lastly, verse 17, we submit to the will of God. Submit to the will of God. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. The will of God. How do we define the will of God? Bruce Waltke, in Finding God's Will, says that it includes God's plan, His providence, His pleasure, and His particular choices in particular situations. That comprises God's will. Other scholars look at God's will and they say it's threefold. The sovereign efficacious will of God, the preceptive will of God, and the dispositional will of God. So you have the sovereign efficacious will of God, what God decrees, what he plans, purpose of that, it will come to pass. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That's God's sovereign efficacious will. Then there's also his preceptive will, which is his will of command. You can break that for a while. You can violate God's preceptive will for a while. But then you will be held accountable for it and he will judge you. And then there's God's dispositional will. What pleases him? Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 33, 11. Why should ye die, O house of Israel? Turn ye, turn ye from your wicked ways, says the Lord. God's dispositional will that all would repent then and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and faith in him. Submit to the will of God. Think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Confronted with the crucifixion on a cross, the most heinous death imaginable, the most heinous death ever concocted by depraved man. Jesus knew it was coming. He must shed his blood for the sins of his people. He's in the garden. In Luke twenty two forty four. 44, it says, He sweat as it were drops of blood. He agonized over that soul. Why? Because he knew the heinousness of it. He knew that he'd have to drink of God's wrath unmixed. That it would be all poured out on him. And he said what? In Luke twenty two forty four, 44, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And you see, Jesus spent all of his walk here on this earth. He said in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 8, 29, the father that sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. You see, the assurance we have in our hearts 
If we submit our wills to God's will and we're walking in His light and in His truth, according to the Spirit's guiding and convicting in our lives, if we do that, that type of submission, submission, sub, under, mateo, to the authority, submitting to the authority of Him, what assurance we have, that no matter what anybody does against us, we have a good conscience, a clear conscience, a blameless conscience, that we will abide. Do we have a good conscience? Do we maintain a good conscience? John MacArthur has a book called The Vanishing Conscience. I think we have that in our library. But our, our society is one, friends, that diminishes the conscience. It sears it. doesn't want anything to do with it. We don't want any convicting voice. We don't want anything saying, is this right or wrong? You see, and God has put his laws in everybody's heart. There's the illumination that is there as far as what is right and what is wrong. I just I told Nance before we left this morning, I've been reading a little on Tozer again. And Tozer died in 1963. And he said this. Died in 1963. He says, now we are putting millions of dollars into religious entertainment. Religious entertainment so that we can dull the consciousnesses of God's people. So that we can dull the consciences of God's people. So that can diminish their moral accountability. And he said, religious entertainment was for retarded Christians. How does that sound in your ears? For retarded Christians. Just think of the whole church growth movement today. That's all it is. It's religious entertainment. And he says the love of the stories that you hear are for children and for people who love religious toys. Kind of grates on us, doesn't it? But yet you see that's what's happened. What's the result of that 40, 50 years later? Where is the conscience in our society today. And John MacArthur says, with a vanishing conscience, if you do away with the conscience, you will raise an amoral and unredeemable generation. You will bear the consequences if you do not have a good conscience and you do not maintain it. And this is where it comes for you and I today is to realize this. The passivity of us as to the beginning of anything in us, that it's all of God. After that initial passivity, there is that responsibility that you and I have then through our moral agency, through our individual effort, striving, persevering, zeal, then, to maintain whatever God has begun or given us. And that goes for the conscience. We cannot maintain a good conscience. We cannot truly fear God, set our hopes, defend the faith, submit to suffering, submitting to the will of man. We cannot do all of that on our own. We need to evidence a total dependency and acknowledge a total dependency we have on God for everything. That's where the Holy Spirit within us comes in. And we know that whom God calls, he enables. We have God's power within. We have the ability to maintain a good conscience. Friends, may our conscience be one of the greatest evangelists to us in all the world. May it speak God's truth to us in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. May it convict us of truth. May we desire to listen to it in that regard. May the gospel of Jesus Christ be continually proclaimed to our conscience in it and through it. And may that with the Spirit's enabling be the chief labor of our daily Christian walk. I close with this. George Washington of all men said this. Labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire 
called the conscience. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you for your word of truth. I thank you for these words of Peter to a persecuted saints. I pray, dear Holy Father, that you would indeed help us to relate. May we have skin in the game. May we know that those who are in Christ are called to suffer. Now, it may not be physical abuse for us. It may be verbal abuse. It may take some other form, social abuse, whatever. But we know that if we step to the line and proclaim God's truth, the ungodly hate you. They hate God's people. They hate your word. That there will be opposition. We know, dear Holy Father, it is part of our calling. We have the power within, the enabling, the boldness, dear Holy Father, through your Spirit's filling, to have an apologia for the faith. I pray you'd help us in that regard, dear Holy Father. Immerse us in your truth. May we be people of the word. May we labor, dear Holy Father, with, you, with your Holy Spirit's aid to maintain a good conscience. Feed our fear of you. Feed our hope. Feed the faith. Feed, dear Holy Father, the knowledge we have of your will. May we stand against the whatsoevers of life. And may you be pleased. May you be pleased to call us.